one. Go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to the City Council meeting for July the 6th, 2021. We will begin by asking the City Secretary to call the roll. Councilman Della Garza? I am present. Councilman Bocknight? Here. Councilwoman Scott? Here. Councilman Young? Here. Councilman Lofgren? Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Solis? Here. With all six members present, we do have a quorum and we will continue this meeting for the City of Victoria. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing as we take a moment of silence to allow each member of the City Council and those in attendance to prepare their hearts and minds to appropriately do the business of our city. Thank you. Sitting in the council chambers remains limited to allow for social distancing, and there are still many residents in our high-risk population. For those reasons, we will continue allowing citizen participation through video conferencing. To learn more about the ways that you can watch the meeting and participate remotely, we encourage you to visit www.victoriatex.gov forward slash talk to council. There are many op options for how you can participate in our meeting tonight, ranging from wa watching on TV or speaking in citizen communications through Zoom. For those citizens that wish, wish to speak in person to the council during citizens communication or during a public hearing, we ask that you complete a comment card and give it to the staff member. Comment cards are located outside of the door of the chamber. Uh, announcements, Mr. Garza, do we have any announcements this evening? Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. We do have a few announcements this evening. First, I'd like to call up Christy Yoker, who is our Environmental and Beautifications Coordinator, to make a special presentation. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Council. We are happily here again to present our Business Beautification Award for July. And I would like to introduce Meredith Bird. She is our vice chair for uh, Keep Victoria Beautiful and also our chair of the Beautification Committee. Welcome. Thank you. On behalf of Keep Victoria Beautiful, we are um, very happy to award Vela Farms with this month's Business Beautification Award. If you haven't uh, looked at her storefront lately, I really encourage you to walk around the corner and see for yourself why we um, chose her for this month's award. With um, you know a storefront that's mostly concrete, she and her staff have gone, gone above and beyond to make Vela Farms from top to bottom, front to back, a warm, welcoming, inviting place to be. She's got cute little bistro tables out front, gorgeous hanging ferns, some beautiful potted plants, wreaths on the door. You can you can tell immediately how much Sarah and her staff uh, care about Victoria, care about their business, and want to put their best face forward. We think she does a fantastic job of keeping her little corner of Victoria beautiful. And so that's why this month we recognize Sarah Vela of Vela Farms as our Keep Victoria Beautiful Award winner. To, uh, to go inside as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and eat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we actually, I will actually invite our city attorney, Thomas Gush, to provide an update for you as well. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of council. Beginning on September 1st, city council will need to change our practice of allowing citizens to participate in our meetings remotely <clears throat> over Zoom. Uh, this change is required after Governor Greg Abbott removed some of his pandemic executive orders. Last year, as a part of the state's pandemic response, Governor Abbott suspended certain Open Meetings Act provisions, 
which would otherwise have re required government bodies to meet and assemble in public uh, with large gatherings of people. Um, we've been relying on that suspension in order to expand our virtual offerings. You know, prior to the meetings, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had been broadcasting our meetings live on cable TV as well as on the city's website. And during the pandemic, we expanded that to include both YouTube Live and Zoom interactive virtual meetings, which allowed the public to actually participate remotely. On June 30th of this year, the governor's office lifted those suspensions. So beginning with our first regular meeting in September, city council meetings will return to conforming to the full requirements of the Texas Open Meetings Act, just as we did before the pandemic. Um, and that will require some changes to our practice. For example, Section 551.127 of the Open Meetings Act requires that the face of any person participating remotely in our meetings must be clearly visible, as well as their voice being audible, so that members of the public can observe the demeanor and hear the voice of each participant. So that is going to require some alterations to the way we conduct our business. We'll continue to post our meetings uh, notification of our meetings uh, publicly. We'll continue to specify a location where council will be gathered as a quorum collectively in one place so that members of the public can participate with us here in our council chambers if they prefer. And we'll continue to broadcast our meetings live to our local cable TV channels, which is 15 and 115. We will broadcast live on our YouTube channel, which is Victoria, Texas videos, and on our local website, www.victoriatx.gov slash talk to council. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and briefly, I wanted to uh, remind everyone of, of what the next few weeks will look like related to our recent election. Um, as you know, we have a special council meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, the 13th. At that council meeting in these chambers at 5 p.m., we will canvas the election results and also call for the runoff election to be held on Saturday, August 21st. Okay. And with that, that wraps up uh, our announcements. Okay, public and uh, employee recognitions. And that's me again. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, and so briefly, I want to call up our city secretary and, and her, her staff um, because they recently uh, were awarded a tremendous recognition, the Excellence Award. Um, the Achievement of Excellence Awards Award program recognizes the statutory requirements and demands for the effective and efficient management of resources for proper governance by the Municipal Clerk's Office. The award recognizes Municipal Clerk offices throughout the state for compliance with federal, state, and local statutes that govern standards necessary that govern, 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 <coughs> govern. <laughs> My wife's gonna kill me on that one. <laughs> necessary to fulfill the duties and responsibilities of the office. Um, this is especially uh, uh, a great uh, recognition because I believe there was only roughly 40, 43 uh, city clerk's offices throughout the state that were recognized with this. And you had to meet nine out of 12 standards and I believe we met all of them and so our team is goes above and beyond and so we're very appreciative of April of you and your team and so thank you all so much. I'll try and not mess this next one up. Um, so this one isn't posted but I thought it would be appropriate to recognize um, at minimum by department, the different players that were involved with having a successful 4th of July event at the community center. I know some of you had a chance to go out there and hopefully you enjoyed it. Obviously this was a return of having the event out there in person considering that in 2020 we did not have an event. Um, as with everything else, we're trying to um, continue to add to the events that we put together to add more experiences for our residents while at the same time continuing to modernize the way that we offer these experiences. And so while many of us involved with the city recognize that the Parks Department you know, manages a facility and is very involved with um, putting on the event, um, there's also a lot of departments that contribute to it behind the scenes, specifically, of course, the Fire Department, Police Department. Um, they do a great job of ensuring, of course, security and 
ma making sure that we're prepared for any scenario. Our emergency operations center um, is involved with this event as well, so we want to thank them. Um, IT, CVB, Public Works, um, they all have staff that play a terrific or important role in putting on the event. Of course, our communications team probably for the first time played a significant role at this particular event as, as we held the event uh, live on Facebook. That was the first time that, that we did that. Um, and so we've received positive feedback on that front. Um, and I think that just shows that we're continuing to um, provide a variety of options for people to enjoy um, our offerings. And I can tell you from being somewhat in the loop of what other cities do that even some larger cities aren't to the point where they're live streaming, you know, things like fireworks show. And so we're very proud of the, of the fact that our team stepped up and we're, we're able to provide that. And hopefully everybody enjoyed it in live or online. So thank you everybody involved with that event. I do better when I don't have to read it. Um, <laughs> Okay. That's it for this evening. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, under items for council, from council, I'd like to first say that I want to thank everybody who came out and voted. I know there was days that it was raining. When I went to go vote, it was raining. So uh, we really want to thank everybody for coming out and showing the support, uh, especially for us up here that, you know, we're trying to do our best and we want to represent you. So we really appreciate you putting your trust in us. And um, I know that we will be having um, a new mayor soon, so I'll be vacating this seat and passing it on. So I really appreciate everything. The staff was great. It is great. I love working with you guys, and you've got my back, and I've got yours. So thank you so much. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> I did want to add on to what Mr. Garza um, said, or add an extra thank you to Glazer's Beer and Beverage for the for their d generous donation of the fireworks display. It was fantastic. Anybody else? Yes. I know I'm not a member of council, but just one quick item. This is where we would normally pull items from the consent agenda, and staff is requesting that we remove item D6 from the consent agenda to be considered uh, individually. Okay. And also item D7 is not ready to go forward tonight, so we'll simply pull that from the agenda. So D7 is completely going to be out, but 6 we will consider. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, under citizens' communication, as a reminder, citizens' communications may be done either in person or through video conferencing. We would encourage anyone who has had any recent exposure to COVID-19 or those that may be in a high-risk population group to make use of the video conferencing option. Those instructions are again available at www.victoriatext.gov forward slash talk to council. Comments will be limited to three minutes in duration and will be received by audio only. There will not be an opportunity to provide any presentation <coughs> or visual material either in person or via teleconference. Please remember to silence any cell phones, televisions, or other background noise <coughs> so that we can clearly hear your comments. It is generally the practice of City Council not to respond to comments made during this time, but City staff will be available to follow as necessary. If you wish to speak about an item scheduled for a public hearing later this evening, please refrain from commenting until we reach that point in the meeting. Are there any comment cards? I have four. Okay. Ann Richter? Hi. I'm sorry if I chopped up your name. That's okay. Do I go ahead and start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I propose the City of Victoria sets up a nonprofit or department to manage a fund of $7 million from the American Rescue Act Fund um, that becomes a PPA and installs solar uh, installations offering public buildings 10% less then they are paying for electricity and giving them the installation after 12 years. 
The fund continues to use its income to reinvest until year 2032 when it begins to take half, invest half, and use about $21 million on Victoria's city buildings and infrastructures. Each year, the return increases. By the year 2041, there will be solar in installations on about 2,744 public buildings. From 2032 to 2041, the City of Victoria collects a total of $434 million to spend as it pleases, and the money will still come in as long as the solar industry makes sense. This is a win-win-win situation where the public buildings uh, win, the taxpayers win, and the city of Victoria wins. And there's not many occasions like that. I'm going to try to get this other proposal <laughs> off really quick. I propose that the city of Victoria and the port of, of Victoria be entitled to the quarterly numbers of tons of EAF dust delivered to Zinc Resources LLC and the number of tons of secondary market products made to determine a more accurate way to measure the toxic heavy metals released in our air. In Spain, 56% of EAF dust is collected after the zinc oxide and iron product are collected. Zinc Resources claims to have no zero waste left. This is a big unbelievable um, discrepancy. Zinc Resources lists four like businesses in the USA. Two of the four zinc recyclers over polluted. American Zinc Recycling Corp in Palmerton, Pennsylvania is a super fund for lead contamination. American Zinc Recycling in Chicago has a consent degree um, to reduce particulate matter by 164 tons per year. I propose with the growth of the Port of Victoria that Victoria monitor pollution at the city limit. I propose the city, county, and Port of Victoria um, adopt a better criteria. The first priority in industrial corridor planning efforts must be to protect public health and the environment while fostering new patterns of economic growth, job growth. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Rick Frauman. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to speak on item E2. Is it, a, uh, uh, is it an option to speak then, or should I speak now? Um, it would be now. There is not an option okay. later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rick Fraum, and I'm with Texas Disposal Systems. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, for the opportunity to speak to you. We uh, participated in your solid waste um, RFP that was uh, initially set out many months ago, and we were uh, finalists. I think we were, uh, unfortunately for us, in second place, which is not where we wanted to be. We were very disappointed. We hoped that we would be here tonight uh, talking about a new contract, but we were very pleased to, to participate in it. We work with your biosolids currently with a long-term contract. We are, as I think you know, but if you don't, we're a privately held family business in Central Texas. We think there's a lot of value in considering that, uh, especially over a, a very large company that's the largest in our industry who you're choosing tonight, which is a public company. We have our, our owners, our families, three generations of people uh, that run our facility in Austin, Texas. We will be expanding into the Victoria area with additional facilities at some point in time in the future. We had the privilege of working with uh, Christy Euchre, who spoke to you uh, earlier, she worked for our company for several years, and uh, we were very sorry to lose her. It's a tremendous asset for the city of Vic Victoria for you to have her as a part of your team. I just wanted to let you know that we were here. We were very pleased to be a part of the process. 
We're disappointed we weren't the selection, but if there's an, any additional discussion in E2, we're certainly here to answer any questions, and we hope to be able to serve you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Stephanie Ross. Hi, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here on behalf of Bethany Senior Living. We are a new skilled nursing facility and secure unit in Port Lavaca. Um, we are over 64,000 square feet uh, with uh, 130 beds. Half of that is dedicated to our secure unit where we're able to help uh, people with Alzheimer's, dementia, um, behaviors, it is completely gated, and so it's very it's very nice and very secure without feeling um, uh, confined. People are able to go throughout the whole facility, outside, and enjoy uh, lots of space. The main reason that I'm here tonight is because we have our VA contract now, and there are not a lot of uh, facilities around who provide VA services. So it is a very big benefit to all of our veterans in our local seven county area. Um, we have people that have come from Houston, from San Antonio, Corpus, um, other facilities that are being overcrowded that, and then other places that don't accept VA benefits where people are having to be sent out. So our goal is to keep people local and offer another option locally where families aren't having to spend three hours driving to visit their loved ones where they're able to stay home. So that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Anthony. Michael Vanderum. Vanderum, I'm sorry. You got it right. Good to oh, go. I saw that. Um, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and um, congratulations on uh, being a granny to you, Mayor you. Pro Tem, and congratulations to Jeff Balknight for almost being the mayor. <laughs> and um, um, we have lots of problems um, in, in the trailer park. Um, there's uh, trailers that really need to be condemned. Um, Chris Watts from Code Enforcement wrote them up on May the 21st, and uh, Rick Madrid and Grace Garcia, she's been helping from code enforcement, and a lot of unnamed people, too <clears throat> many uh, to describe, and uh, congratulations to Rick Madrid on his certification. He's got so many certifications, I can't keep up and name them all. But um, anyway, um, these empty trailers, their door is open and they attract gangs. You know, um, 10 years ago, a, a gangster came and shot someone three times and killed him, you know. And uh, they just, uh, the reason it's peaceful because the Victoria Police Department and Sheriff's Department, they uh, arrest two of the big time criminals. Uh, one was eluding police and sheriff's deputies on a motorized bicycle for years, but uh, uh, his crime spree caught up with him and he's in jail. And the other, you know, it's been, you know, uh, vacant and all these doors are open and people can come in and out and, you know, they just need, they're not worth anything. If you hooked it up to an 18 wheeler to pull it, it would just fall apart. They're not worth nothing. I just wish Whoever owns these trailers could just uh, sign them over to Attorney Fitz. I mean, he's one of the most successful personal injury uh, attorneys, you know, in the state of Texas, and he's got deep pockets. So, you know, I would just like them to sign the trailer houses to him, and he could just pay the money and have a bulldozer tear them up and move them out of there, you know. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate everyone's effort into all this. And, you know, there's too many people to describe in uh, three minutes and too many problems to talk about in three minutes. But that's what will help and, you know, beautify the trailer park. You know, it would never be, you know, beautiful, but it, it would be, um, you know, at least better, at least go from a three to a four. Um, but anyway, thanks and um, for having me. Thank you. Michael. Do we have any citizens wishing to speak to us through video conference? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, we have a Brett Paul. Brett Paul, you're allowed to speak. I 
uh, he just disconnected, so I guess he didn't want to speak. Okay. Well, if he comes back on later, I guess. Okay. Items for public hearing. Yeah, hi. This is, oh, uh, he is. Brett Paul. Go ahead. Um, I'm with Victoria Equity Group. Um, just commenting, uh, wanted to make myself available uh, regarding the uh, on the agenda point D6, which uh, got removed from the consent agenda, but will be considered uh, separately. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm here and, and available for any question questions the council may have on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pr uh, Paul. Okay, April. Oh, any more people? Nobody else. Okay, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Item C1 is an ordinance amending chapters five and nine of the Victoria City Code by adopting the 2021 International Building Code series as amended. Good evening, Mayor Person and Council. Um, so uh, I'm going to lead this off. Um, my name's on the <coughs> agenda item memo, but as you know, this is um, a team effort with really Rick um, being the team leader. So I have Rick Madrid and Tom Legler here to help me with any questions y'all may have. Uh, before I get started in the presentation, I do just want to recognize Rick. Um, he was actually just um, appointed to the um, International Co-Council IECC Development Committee um, for the 2024 development of the new energy code. He um, uh, actually was appointed to the residential committee, um, and there's only 48 members nationwide or internationally, I guess. And um, he is the only code official out of Texas that will be represented um, on this committee. And so we're very proud of him and very excited for him to basically carry the weight of Texas on his shoulders. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Uh, so back to the presentation, um, our code update process, as you know, started with the insurance service office um, building code effectiveness grading schedule review um, in which um, ISO said we needed to update our um, building codes to maintain our ratings. Um, so with that, we went forward to um, create our uh, adopt the, the 2021 building codes. So the Board of Adjustment and Appeals held 17 workshops. Our Rick and Tom held 17 workshops um, to go over all of the different code books that are a part of the ICC codes. And at the their June 8th meeting, the build, Board of Appeals and Adjustments uh, unanimously recommended approval of the ICC codes. So what we're asking for tonight is to um, recommend adopting the 2020, these 2021 ICC codes as we've amended them um, that are shown in the packet. And that includes the International Building Code, the International Residential Code, the International Energy Conservation Code, the International Mechanical Code, Plumbing Code, Fuel Gas Code, Fire Code, and the International Existing Building Code. So that's the action that we're asking for tonight. Um, but since we are in front of you, I did want to take a minute to kind of talk about what's next. We still have some codes that we need to bring back to council for adoption, and that includes our property maintenance code, um, which code enforcement uses primarily for substandard buildings, our national electric code, which is not part of an ICC code. And then we have a lot of cleanup on chapter five that we'd like to do. Um, and so we wanna get some council feedback on some of that cleanup that we are discussing um, in our office. One would be um, contractor license requirements. Currently we require contractors to um, register with the city for a fee of $200. Um, the state licensed contractors do not have to pay that $200, but they do have to provide us with their um, copy of their state license. We would like to amend that um, those licensing requirements to add to that fee I require a minimum of 100,000 in commercial liability insurance. Um, we would recommend um, accepting or exempting out the state license trades um, because as part of their state license, they are required to hold commercial liability insurance. So this um, liability insurance requirements would affect all of the other contractors, mainly your building contractors and remodelers. 
Um, it would not affect your state licensed tradesmen. Um, so we want some feedback on that. Uh, we also are looking at updating our swimming pool regulations. Uh, the biggest thing is requiring a five foot clear space measured from the coping or the pool wall for emergency service personnel. Um, right now there's a requirement for a 10 foot separation between electrical components, but we don't have um, any setback requirements for pools or um, a, a parameter that's required. So we would be looking at, at establishing a parameter so that um, emergency service personnel could access the pool in case of an emergency, or really just any lifeguard on duty. Um, penalties need to be updated for our court of record. And then um, we also have in, some issues with our demolition delay. Uh, we need to, the city needs to establish a historic preservation officer for section 106 reviews. Anytime federal funds are being spent, um, there has to be a section 106 review completed. And um, currently, People performing the Section 106 reviews kind of don't really have direction on who to um, contact to perform those. So they'll sometimes reach out to the city, um, my, my office, sometimes reach out to Victoria Preservation Inc. But I think that it would be very good for the city formalized and adopted a historic preservation officer for the city um, out of my office. So those are some discussion points. Um, we council has any input on what next? We'd be happy to. Um, I have a question about swimming pool regulations. In that five foot clear space, does that mean you can't put chairs within that five foot space? No, it'd be for structural. Okay. Uh, fences. So lifeguard stands okay? Yes, we would have to write that stuff, those exceptions in. Okay. Diving boards, life yeah. <laughs> stands. The intent is so that people can access all around. We have seen some plans where. There's a pool right next to a, you know, a, a fence or right next to a wall, and it just, just doesn't seem very safe. And is that five foot clear all the way around? What if someone built it up abut it to their home? That would it would be all the way around. <coughs> um, most of the time, it does have to be set off from the home because you have plugs in the rear and you have to have at least ten feet from electrical. Um, so it it can be really close to a home but most of the time you actually see it offset from a home just because of the electrical requirements. So if someone decided to oh, design their swimming pool with a wall that had a waterfall on one side, that would be a, a violation? We've talked about how we would um, look at that and we would count the waterfall. It would be the, the wall of the waterfall on the other side. So beyond the waterfall because diving rocks are another consideration. So it, it needs some work on how we define this, um, but the goal is to try and provide as much access as possible. We've also talked about um, allowing a percentage to not be a part of that three foot or five foot space. We've also talked if it needs to be three foot rather than five foot. So conceptually though, we would like to bring back and this has been a problem with emergency service personnel? Um, I don't know that we've had any calls. I mean, are we looking for a s solution to a problem that doesn't exist? As a, as a pool owner, um, I, I believe that it would be a very safe uh, rule to have. And this would be residential and business? Yes. Or also and goals. public? Mm -hmm. What if somebody built an infinity pool? Yeah, right. I mean, there's there's so many exceptions you're gonna have to write on this. I think you're gonna have a real trouble coming up with it. I've seen pools butted up against homes. I've seen the mm -hmm. infinity edge on the other side, and I just I don't see how it's gonna work. Okay. And most swimming pools in town, residential swimming pools, I know for a fact they're easy to get someone out. They're not. 100 foot wide. Um, I, mean, I guess on the other side of it, we wouldn't want something where emergency personnel absolutely couldn't get somewhere without getting wet. And I'm, I'm guessing that that's what they're trying to get at is that uh, you can, there, there's some space maybe on one side of the pool, maybe not on all sides of the pool, but if you've got a pool that's, that's built up all around, You've got emergency personnel have no choice but to all get in the water. That 
I would think that's what they're trying to accommodate. We could put some language together about uh, the percentage has to be, and we can also um, reduce it to three foot. The idea is that you move faster on land rather than water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I can see by the time the emergency personnel show up and we have a great time to response is what, five, six minutes? I don't think anybody's gonna be left floating in the pool in the middle. No, I, it's not so much problem. emergency, I guess it's more for emergency rescue operations more so than emergency service personnel. You're trying to save some from, someone from the pool. Um, but if you think there's too many obstacles, we can definitely strike it. That's what we're here for tonight. I can see something. some major issues with that, major issues. But, I, I mean, I could see it as just a, an area to allow a stretcher in or something like that. But if someone's having an, a, whatever medical emergency in a pool, someone's usually going in after them. Mm -hmm. And that five foot, they don't care that there's five foot runway to jump into the pool. They just want to get to the person, right? So I don't, that's just my thought on it. I have 31 years as a paramedic and a firefighter. I don't think it's an issue. Uh, the, the okay. One wall, it's not going it, to, well, we're going to get them out. We have the tools and equipment and, some, and training. I don't understand this. Have we looked at other cities? Um, yes, I've worked in other cities where we had this requirement. What about if somebody already has a pool put in and they, they don't have the five foot clearance? It would Are be, they gonna be grandfathered? Yes, it would not affect them. It's just not for new right construction. Right. And if they have to go in there and do some structural renovation to the pool, will they be subject to this rule now? Not unless they were completely removing it and building a brand new pool. Okay. But I, I can see some, some thought for this because as our lots are getting smaller and smaller because that is the tendency. And people don't like to do yard work and so our pools are getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I can see people putting in a pool that pretty much takes up the entire backyard and um, not thinking about emergency people needing to get in there and having some type of space to work. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, too, that somebody's going to get someone out, but... Um. We currently allow pools and setbacks, so pools are only prohibited in easements, and then they have to be 10 feet away from all electrical, whether it be an outlet or, um, you know, line, buried line or such. How often do we do the uh, codes? When was the last time we did the codes that we're voting on tonight? Um, the swimming pool code it has, hasn't really been looked at. No, no, I think. no, no. I'm talking about the ones that you're proposing for tonight. Oh, usually, usually after two code cycles, so about seven or six, seven years. 2015 was the last time we adopted. So we'll take take your you know everyone's comments and see if we can come up with some language that addresses those. If not, we will strike that from the chapter five. Um, is there any other comments on us, the items that we're moving forward with? How often do uh, contractors uh, license? Is it an annual? Yes, ma'am. And this really is, we, we have been receiving a lot more complaints. Um, a lot of the times it, it's not code related things, it's more contract administration with, um, from different citizens, but they want the city to come in and help them. You know, if it's not code related, we can't help them, but we could, you know, hopefully provide them with more information. Um, yeah, and Texas is one of the states that doesn't have state licensing for general contractors. Um, other states do license their general contractors, so there's no continuing education piece on code updates and such. <laughs> the responsible general contractors do keep up with all that but there's certainly a, a handful of them there that don't pay attention to what the code really is and um, don't have to carry insurance. That's a good point. Most of, uh, most of the large um, outfits do carry insurance mm -hmm. and the um, state licensed trade minimum insurance requirements are much greater than 100,000. I think they start at 300,000 and 
there's a lot of different exceptions as far as per instance and stuff, and it depends on whether it's an electrical license or a plumbing license. But I think they all generally start at 300,000. Julie, how are you gonna handle the people that are their own self-contractors, their own general contractors when they're building something? So homestead homeowners, we would yes. exempt. They, they don't require um, a contractor's license. So I actually didn't put them on the exemption because they don't require a contract um, license. And then we would also exempt employees acting as businesses. So basically your maintenance men, because they're not, um, you know, they're working on behalf of, of that company. So they're not out. Um, doing work for the general public. But in the past, you've issued uh, contract licenses for homeowners. If a homeowner owns, um, it's they're not their homestead and, and they own um, multiple rental properties, then we require, we consider them a contractor. So they would have to get their license? Yes. Okay. But if it's their homestead. Are they going to be required to have the $100,000 insurance minimum? Yes, ma'am, if we move forward with this. This is a first reading of this, and so obviously it could be a lot of information just to kind of And these items review. actually aren't in the ordinance tonight. These are the, the next group. The next group that I, I realize that, but you still need to think about that because heck, I've pulled the contractor's license myself. So, you know, um, but where I see maybe a hiccup would be the people that have rental property. And then now they're going to be required to get $100,000 worth of insurance to be able to work on their own properties? That's what you're saying, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. By the same token, then somebody saying I'm licensed by the city has some meaning. Right now, somebody can say I'm licensed by the city it's just a registration. Registration, the general population thinks that means something, thinks that gives them some credibility that's not there. And this would give the public some of the backing or strength that they think that means. So on your presentation, are you gonna go through each of the codes and talk about major amendments or anything? Or is that something? No, like to do later. It, it'll offline. be question based. Um, and so you'd be happy to answer any questions based on those amendments. Um, so if there's no more questions on what's next, <laughs> back to what we're asking tonight is to for approval of uh, or adoption of an ordinance that adopts these codes as we've amended them. And we're happy to answer any of questions related to those amendments. Um, the red line versions of the ordinance was provided in the agenda packet. I've tried to read through it. I was having trouble without the code book there with me. I'll, I'll just call Mr. Madrid and go through those. There's some that I know were important to Raleigh and, and myself, and I want to make sure that they're, they're captured. And this I bet can, they are. We've talked about it. This is our first enough. reading, right? So we have a second and third yet? Absolutely. Second yes, ma'am. So right. that was that's what I was getting to, that um, <clears throat> we can provide more specific information, could have more time to review the red line version that Julie pointed out. Um, we could talk about it at our one-on-one, -on -one, our July one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, and we could always place it as a discussion item rather than just consent the next time it comes up um, if there are any additional questions or there needs to be additional discussion. Um, obviously, this is one of those elements that because it could be a lot and can be very specific, hence the process of the stakeholder input, um, hence the involvement of the committee. Um, to bring forward the recommendation because the expectation is that, you know, through all that work, we can bring you a product that has already been vetted um, by different stakeholders to hopefully limit, um, not limit, reduce um, the amount of um, issues that might arise associated with it. And I do want to commend your department. Um, holding the 17 workshops, that's a lot. Yes. Um, Y'all were definitely out there asking for contractor input and we're very open and respect re receptive to what what was said in each of the meetings i went to and really really appreciate it and thank you for making that effort thank you i can't give rick madrid enough credit i echo he, that same he's thing he's been I, through this a time or two though <laughs> <laughs> 
I echo that same thing. I, I went to one of the meetings thinking that I would understand some of the things that were said. And um, even though most of them went way over my head, um, Mr. Madrid really did a great job of explaining what he was talking about. And All right, I move that we adopt item C1. A second. Yes. Oh. Oh, Mayor Burton, don't yeah. forget we need a public hearing on public this before hearing. we get to the vote. Oh, okay. I withdraw my second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can have the public hearing after we have the motion. Oh, the second. That's fine. My second. <laughs> we can keep those on, on the record. Okay. At this time, we'll open the meeting for public hearing. If you wish to speak to this item, please use the raise your hand feature on the Zoom or submit a comment card to city staff. Are there any comment cards on this item? Seeing none. Uh, any more discussion? Oh, none? Okay. If not, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those in, not in favor or opposed? <laughs> okay, it was Jeff and... Everybody. No, no, but who seconded? I did. Okay, Jen, okay. Okay, motion carries. The consent agenda. Hey. Um, just a reminder that items D6, D6 was pulled for separate consideration and item D7 we can consider at a uh, future meeting. So uh, item D1 is the adoption of the minutes of the June 15th, 2021 regular council meeting and the special meetings on June 21st and June 22nd. Item D D2 is an ordinance establishing first uh, the city of Victoria Victoria, City of Victoria Municipal Court as a court of record, and this is on second and third reading. Item D3 is a resolution approving a contract with uh, Evaqua Water Technologies to recon recondition the chlorine scrubber located at the surface water treatment plant in the amount of $59,816. Item D4 is an ordinance amending and readopting traffic regulation schedules as provided in various sections of city code. This item is also on the second and third reading. Item D5 is a resolution approving a variance to section 21-82A1 for a property located at 605 North Cleveland Street to allow for replatting of a single family residential lot with a total lot size of 3,751 square feet. Item D8 is a resolution approving the renewal of an annual supply contract for Brintag Southwest Incorporated for liquid phosphate based corrosion inhibitor in an estimated amount of $60,750. Item D9 is Item D9 is a resolution approving the renewal of an annual supply contract for International Dioxide Incorporated for liquid sodium chloride in an estimated amount of $119,520. And item D10 is a resolution approving the renewal of an annual supply contract for PINCO Incorporated for liquid ferrous chloride in an estimated amount of $79,886.40. Item D11 is a resolution rejecting a non-responsive proposal for a vendor services agreement for citywide uniform rental services. I move Who we adopt we? the consent agenda as present, presented. I second it. Has been first and seconded by Jeff and Mark. Are those on any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. We'll go back and do item D6 as a resolution approving a variance to section 21-83A2 for properties located at 8401 and 8405 North Navarro Street, uh, 108 Primrose Street, and 702 Bingham Road to allow for replatting of property into commercial lots with four of the proposed commercial lots having lot widths below the minimum requirement for commercial <coughs> lots. Mayor Pro Tem and Council members, uh, staff requested that we pull this item from consent agenda solely so that I could point out to you there's been a minor correction. Uh, in the draft that was included in the electronic packet, we neglected to include a condition on the variance that the Planning Commission applied at when it, this item was before them. And so I have a substituted version of this resolution that has been distributed at your desk, and you can see that condition applied there at numbered paragraph two near the bottom of the page. I just wanted to make it clear since it was not included in the 
version that went out to the public that this was not intended to be a change to what the Planning Commission passed. This, this resolution would approve the variance as approved by the Planning Commission in the same form. Unless there are any questions for the substantive, uh, any, any versions about that change, then I will turn this back over to you. I move we adopt item D6. Second. Okay, then first and seconded. Um, are there any further discussion on this item? If not, a call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Action items for council discussion. Item E1 is a resolution awarding the Airline Road Water, Sanitary Sewer, and Street Improvements Project to JR Contracting Incorporated of Victoria, Texas for the low proposal amount of $1,371,294. Is I'll make a brief presentation. Good evening. Uh, this is for the Airline Water Line and Street Mill Overlay Project, the award to the contractor. The vicinity map, the project limits are from Navarro to Laurent. It's basically the mill and overlay portion is to correct that portion around West Outfall that's, that's pretty rough. We've had several patches in there with the old 16-inch water line. If you'll notice, the map does include a portion going all the way to Azalea. That is to complete the lining of that sewer line on airline. It'll, it'll complete it from Ben Jordan all the way to now Laurent. In addition, on the other side of Laurent, the be the west side, we're gonna install some sewer services and some water services in that short section up to about where radio, the old radio shack was. Their sewers are connected in the back. We wanna get services up front so that at some point they can replumb their lines. The, the lines in the back alleys are failing on both north south side. <coughs> uh, Project description, replace about 2,400 feet of 16-inch uh, cast iron water main, all the appurtenances, hydrants, bins, services. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 860 linear feet of the 24-inch sewer lining. And then mill and overlay that section of uh, airline, about 2,800 square feet. Uh, we received two proposals, one from JNR Contracting of Victoria for $1,371,294 and Lester Contracting of Port Lavaca for $1,836,377.25. We are recommending the uh, lower proposal with j &R Contracting. And we are continuing to use the competitive sealed proposal method. Project timeline, uh, June 9th, we uh, sent out, the, we received the proposals of course, July 6th today will award the contract if, it, if it's acceptable. And then the contract execution in September, begin construction October and completion uh, middle of December. It's a 400 day calendar day project. <coughs> and I'll entertain any questions. Can I ask again, what are we doing with the road? We're gonna mill, yeah. uh, mill the outside, for sure the outside lanes and there'll be some milling in the middle, but we're gonna mill that about two inches, two and a half inches. Then we'll come right over that, put a seal coat. That's typical, you wanna seal that pavement because you've, you've ground off that compacted layer. And then we'll put two inches of hot mix on it, a type D hot mix, restripe it. That will take out all the big dips and everything? That's the plan. If we have to, and we also included level up in that item so that if it gets deeper than two inches, there is a level up item, so they'll, they're not just gonna follow the road and just put two inches. They're gonna put whatever it is to make a nice level surface. So it's three inches. We, we have an item to pay that extra amount of hot mix. Now, 400 days. With this rain. <laughs> Sounds like a long time. We already got Crestwood under construction for 400 some odd days. But I'm under, I don't, this is less work, right? Correct. Yeah, like which which we're, lanes will be closed? We're we're gonna we're, <clears throat> our, our proposal is to keep two lanes open during the direction. construction of the water line. That's going to be the longest time when they start the street work. It's it's going to go really quick. I mean, within within a month, I'm going to say they're 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 not going to mill it 
leave it exposed and wait that long. They'll mill it, seal it, and then overlay it and stripe it soon after that. that and, that's the quickest portion. And we can get a more specific you know, timeline well, once we kick off the project. Correct. We um, will. And so once we do that, we can provide that to you as well. Obviously, these contracts typically are very extreme in terms of um, the time that it could take, but normally it, you know, we won't benchmark take this type days. of work with other municipalities and timelines. Do that. Excuse you me. Mean, you mean he, benchmarking the contracts in terms of the language in the contract on how many length days? Of, length of time. Right, in the contracts. If we right, look at how many linear feet of water some other right. city's doing. Because there's, in my opinion, there's two different things, right? There's the verbiage in the contract, and then there's the actual work. Um, and those typically are different timelines. Um, I don't know on the contract side. I'm not sure we, if there's been comparison in terms of that aspect of it. We On this contract, we let the contractors select a time, and they were both within, I think, 10 sure. days. In their, bids. in their bid, in their bids, yeah, yeah. But, so the yeah. the other option or the alternative approach would have been for when soliciting bids to put the specific timeline ahead of time. Um, and, and we then, do that on a, on some of our contracts. We do put the specific timeline. Well, the reason I bring it up is I used to work in heavier construction and we'd build an entire factory in a year and I don't understand why these contracts keep coming in with these long windows of time and I've got my business on Crestwood I know there are multiple days that they're not working so I don't know if we just have a labor shortage in Victoria and they have to keep their book and they got to rotate around crews to other projects but it doesn't seem like our projects get dedicated crews to work on them consistently. And, and I'll bring Crestwood as an example. They, they can't work on, a, they gotta finish those utilities first and there's a process. In other words, what, you'll, what they wanna do is start on the uh, sewer line, sanitary sewer. So that crew is dedicated to putting in the sewer because you don't want another, his other crew work on the water because those two are gonna conflict. You want that, that water line can go up and down and around and, and swing. So he's putting his, sanitary in, then he's going to put in the storm and then the water. You start running different <coughs> crews in different alignments, then when he gets to, to the water line or he's putting a sewer line in the hit, then now we've got to do adjustments to the water line because the grades didn't match or there's, there's a uh, issue with the alignment. So that's kind of why they're taking a lot longer than you think. We've got three utilities on Crestwood then the street work begins, which is concrete, and keeping that traffic open. But it's linear. It's linear. So That's now they're correct. on the Devero side. Why isn't someone working on the other end of the street with the other utility and coming down? And I believe they are. On the storm sewer, it's, they're, they're working. I know they've been working on that storm sewer here lately because we're running into conflict boxes with services. So they are working on storm sewer as when they get done with it, not done with the sanitary, but as they're moving along. The other issue that we're running into is we've got AT&T and Southwestern Bell. I mean, AT&T and uh, AEP. Their facilities are in the way. And a lot of times on Crestwood Phase 1, we were on their tail. And it was. It came down to a line where the contractor was moving. He he had to. He was going to have to leave. Luckily, we had AT and T to come in there and do it. But they have to work around those utility poles, and that takes extra time, extra trench protection, uh, extra crews to be out there with traffic control. It's it's a slow process. I don't know. We can speed it up. I'm sure there are ways to do it. But as you know, speeding up that time is going to increase the cost of the project. I, I asked this, and uh, but I didn't hear an answer. Um, Crestwood, of course, traffic is only going one direction. Uh, you said you're going to keep this at two lanes. Is that two lanes, one in each direction? Yes. Or is that two lanes? No, one? two lanes in each direction. One in each direction. Yes, ma'am. And, and because of the fact that we have Crestwood down to one lane, one direction, We've got, we don't want to just wipe out east and west 
so many streets in a row, and that is, we're aware of that. Thank you. I, I expected that would be the answer, but uh, just thought it would be good for everybody to hear it out loud. Yes. Oh, I move we adopt item E1. I second, second it. Thank you. Well, wait, it's been first and second. Any discussion? So I'll third it if I have to. Okay. You call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Yeah. Motion carries. Chair. Item e no C. <laughs> Item E2 is a resolution approving a service contract with Waste Management of Texas Incorporated for Solid Waste Services. Good evening, Mayor, or Mayor Pro Tem and Council, future Mayor. Uh, we are going to tag team this. Uh, Dave Yonke is here from NewGen. Um, he will be doing some parts. I will be doing some parts. But I want to recognize a few people, too. Um, I want to thank TDS for coming. We also have Scott and BJ Nelson, who are the owners of White Trash, who are here. And then we have uh, Shanna Lopez and Dale Smith with Waste Management here as well. So uh, they will be available if there's any questions. So I'm going to go through kind of a brief history. <coughs> Prior to 1991, the city picked up its own commercial. Um, that's kind of the time that we started looking uh, that we needed to find someone to do it for us just because of the labor problems and truck problems that we had. So we uh, got a, created the first contract with Waste Management in 1993. There were 30 amendments through the years. Um, most of council won't remember, but they had at one point an evergreen contract, which means every year it rolled over for five more years. Um, that was one of the first things I addressed when I came to work for the city, and we kind of put a term date to it. Um, in 2012, we introduced the HHW and the single stream recycling. Um, and then in 2018, we decided we wanted to do a commercial feasibility study. We wanted to look at it because the contract was coming up, but the other part was is would we be able to do this ourselves and make it work? and make it work well for the city. And what we decided to do was do an RFP and then compare us to those RFPs. A little background, we have 1,608 commercial con uh, containers in town. We have 203 roll-offs, 79 permanent, which means you're talking HEB, uh, Walmart, Sam's, uh, full-time, those containers are there every day. Um, and then we, this temporary changes. It could be as low as 80. It could be as high as 150. Those are contractors that come into town and are working on different things. Some of them may be home builders. Some of them may be working on a uh, highway. They may be working through TxDOT, school system, different things like that. We have 20,000 household hazardous waste customers. Those are our residences. And then we have our recycle, uh, can, uh, recycle center. That's, that we run over off of uh, George Street. It also, the, the, you have to remember, that price that it takes to run that affects those same 20,000 customers because that's built into the recycle rate. And so what I'm going to do is turn it over now to Dave Yonke with NewGen, and I'm going to let him go through a few slides, and he's going to talk about the background, the study, and, and what we found as we went through the process. Uh, good evening. For the record, my name is Dave Yonke. I'm the president of New Gen Strategies and Solutions. Uh, for some of you, if this is the first time or I, first time I've presented before you and you're on council and I haven't met you, just for background, I've been involved in these types of studies for cities for about 25 years. Um, so this is something that I focus on uh, pretty extensively. So as Daryl mentioned, uh, you know, we were hired, as you know, the contract with waste management for collection of commercial waste expires October 31st, 2021. So our firm was hired back in 2019 to conduct a three-year pro forma analysis to look at, was it feasible for the city to consider taking over the commercial uh, front load collection operation when the contract expired? 
So let me ask you, or and let me tell you, sometimes the question comes up, why do you want to conduct the study? What's the benefit associated here? So we do these studies for a number of clients, municipalities. And so some of the key reasons for looking at municipalization, in other words, it's provided by city crews. Number one, you're collecting all the garbage. So that guarantees that it'll go to your city owned landfill. Uh, secondly, uh, if the city's uh, providing the service, the opportunity is there to potentially provide a higher level of service uh, than a private operator. Um, third, uh, and one of the key items here we wanted to look at was there the potential for the city to generate some additional general uh, additional revenue that could go to the general fund. Uh, we went through the study. In fact, uh, it's footnoted at the bottom. I was here before the council uh, back on August 27th, 2019, presenting our findings and recommendations. Based on that analysis, when I was here almost two years ago, uh, we recommended that the city move forward with the procurement process to put the commercial services out to bid and then evaluate the results to see, does it make sense for the city to take it over or should it be contracted with, with a private operator? Um, one of the key recommendations we made at that time, almost two years ago, is we did say, and it's that second bullet, we said the city may need to evaluate the impact on the cost of the other services provided by waste management. And specifically what we're saying is when we started looking at the cost of contracting these services out, there are some services that are perceived as not being as attractive to provide, uh, specifically household hazardous waste and operation of the recycling staging facility. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but you have to look at the total package and what's the overall best benefit for the city when you do the analysis. And so I'm gonna go through a timetable. We advertised July 6th of 2020 uh, and the August 2nd. We issued uh, the RFP on the 27th. We had a mandatory pre-bid on the 20th of August. Um, the Submeto deadline was November 5th. Uh, we conducted, conducted in-person meetings in January and then started negotiations in February, March timeframe. Now, I will say due to a certain bill that we all know about, I kind of slowed things down because we didn't know if we were going to end up with a 2% franchise fee or if we were going to be able to stay with where we're at, which is 15%. Um, we received six bids. Um, Herein lied the issue that Dave just addressed. Out of the six bids we received, the only bid that did not have all in, which means we want all four lines of business or nothing, was white, white trash. Um, they said, if you give us this, we'll take this. If you give us this, we'll take this. But it wasn't necessarily individually priced like we had hoped to see from everyone, because then that would give us an idea of what we're kind of cost we're actually looking at for us to do the HHW and the recycle center, um, and what it would cost us to then our tipping fee would be when we take it to these processing facilities. So we didn't quite get what we hoped we would get. So here's the committee, and I can't thank them enough. There's a lot of hours that have gone into this thing, um, as well as uh, Dave and Allison, who work at NewGen. You have myself, Mike, uh, ATN, Gilbert, and Laura. And Laura was a help from the very beginning. She's been a great help because she helped put the RFP together, helped put the RFP out. We had a little bit different format than what I was used to using in the past, uh, and I think it's worked very well. So I'm gonna go through scoring and I'm gonna show you some sheets in a minute and I don't need you to focus in on the sheets and try and read the lines, but they're here just to, to, to show you what, how each individual line of business was scored. And so our scoring process took into account experience, litigation history, 
environmental violations, statement of organization, staffing, subcontractors, implementation plans, available resources, financial stability, financial statements, insurance requirements, and bonding capacity or commitment. This is the first page, and we're looking at the task order one, which was the commercial. And so this is the first page of that. This is the second page. This is the third page and the final page. That we did one of these for all four lines of business. So each company had 16 pages of scoring. So when we talk about experience, we just wanted to bring some highlights up to show you kind of what we were looking for. So we wanted a minimum of three years experience in the municipal solid waste <coughs> uh, collection, at least two contracts with city, <laughs> state, or government. Um, that could be with, uh, but they had to be franchise contracts. They had to, you had to be the only contractor for that city. They had to be exclusive. You must have collected, and this is for the commercial especially, 25,000 tons or 100,000 cubic yards in two of those cities on an annual basis. And then you have to have a manager supervisor with five years experience in a similar role or a comparable project. <clears throat> Available resources. Um, this is the part I spent most of my time on. Do you have enough trucks? Do you have enough backup trucks? Do you have enough containers? Are you going to have enough backup containers? What are your containers? What kind of, what's the age of your fleet that you're uh, gonna bring in? We did have a three year uh, maximum, so you could not bring in a vehicle that's over three years old. Um, what does your staff look like? Are they qualified staff? Have they been in this business a long time? What does your support look like? If we have a hurricane and we need help, what can you bring to the table to help us when that's done? So we started with six bidders. Uh, we went through the scoring process and we picked out the top three. We interviewed the three candidates. Um, we narrowed it down to two. Of course, the two, bidder, uh, the, the two that we narrowed it down to, and you've already heard from Texas Disposal Systems, was them and waste management. We began negotiations with waste management um, early this year and started working through uh, the process, the pricing, um, and what we could see happen for the city in the next 10 years. So, <clears throat> Dave, this one's yours. Yep. Yeah, going on a roll, you're going to take did. my slide. <laughs> so if, if you heard me when I was up here before, I mentioned one of the things, our recommendations <clears throat> in August of 2019 was to look at the impact of if the city were to operate the service, provided themselves, what would be the impact on HHW and recycling operations. And that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about on this slide. But um, the first bullet, and I'll go down, and I wanna be clear, just to give you an idea, I'm meeting with another city in two weeks in a work session on a Saturday, and there they are looking at commercial municipalization where it does make sense for the city to take it over, okay? And I'll be discussing that with them. The reason we are not recommending the city take over uh, the collection service here is first of all, the first bullet, waste management, they came in with a very aggressive bid. Your front load solid waste business is the largest segment of this contract by far. The second one is the roll off business. Um, they came in and overall, the revenues, they lowered their prices by about $650,000 a year, okay? That's a direct benefit to the commercial businesses in the city. I wanna be clear, very clear on this. Some customers, your smaller customers, once a week dumpsters, you'll see some rate increases, but overall, where the majority of your waste is moving, the larger dumpsters getting picked up, say, more than three times a week, they're gonna see decreases. So the point is waste management came in very hungry for the business, lowered the, the proposed rates. The second item there, like I said, that's the largest portion of the commercial waste stream. So that's 
the portion they lowered their rates on. The third item, and this is the important thing, again, back in 2019 when I was here, I said, if the city decides, hey, we want to get into the commercial front load business, well, you're going to have to go contract with someone to continue to provide that HHW program, someone to operating the recycling staging facility. Those aren't real attractive services that people are just lining up to, to provide. I'm not going to call them dogs, but they're essential services that people want. Um, so I guarantee you that you're going to have to pay more if you go out to contract for those if the city is providing front load collection service. So bottom line, when we finished our analysis, looking at everything, the upside, if everything goes perfectly for the city under this scenario with what was proposed by waste management, the city could be looking at potentially an additional $200,000 a year to the general fund. Now, that's not insignificant, but I also want to emphasize that means they take on the risk of operating this business, and if anything goes wrong, they're taking care of all those things that Daryl mentioned before. They do have the backstopping from the firm when it comes to hurricanes on some of these different events or storm events. So um, quite frankly, when the pencils got sharpened on those final proposals for the marginal amount of money, and that's a lot of money, 200 grand, it's just not worth the <clears throat> risk that the city's going to have to bear. So that was our recommendation. I do want to make one thing clear. When we talk about hurricanes, uh, y'all may be questioning because we do have a contract with Ashbrook. It's not so much the hurricane damage that they clean up. It's the expectation that they, if their office is hit by the hurricane, that they have the equipment to start service as soon as possible after it's safe to get back on the street. Um, that's that two-day window to where we, our expectation is, is that they're calling around the state of Texas and pulling trucks in here to get my customers picked up. So I, I wanted to make sure that that was clear and nobody was confusing that with our actual dem, uh, uh, debris management contract. So, these are just a few points. Um, they had the highest score in the process. They were qualified in all four lines of business. They had the lowest increase to our residential customers. And so the best overall value to the city. <clears throat> a couple things that Dave touched on that I'm going to cover. 7% reduction to our heavy users on commercial. Well, how many customers is that? It's 62% of our commercial customers are going to be seeing a reduction in their monthly solid waste fees that they pay for their dumpsters. That's significant, 62%. Roll off, the permanent roll off, those 26 customers, they're not gonna see a rate increase. Their rates stay the same as they are right now. However, the 124, and remember that number fluctuates, <coughs> they will see a small increase, it's about $25. Household hazardous waste rates will increase from 59 to 69 cents, and there will be a 10 cent increase on the recycle. <clears throat> Excuse me, the curbside recycling as well. Other contributions: um, they're going to donate ten thousand uh, dollars or one thousand dollar a year to keep Victoria beautiful. They're going to donate five thousand dollar commitment to the annual fireworks show. Uh, they'll pay royalties up front. That's the 15%. They'll pay, uh, we will receive that uh, in October of every year instead of monthly throughout the year. Uh, this allows finance to do maybe some extra things with that. And then I won't go through all of these, but these are all the portalette donations that they will do throughout the year. These are all geared towards parks events. Um, and so there's street dances, Veterans Day parades. And downtown events. And downtown mm -hmm. events. Sorry. And so it's a 10-year contract with up to uh, five one-year extensions. And staff recommends that you pass the contract, and we'll be here, Dave and I, to answer any questions. Gilbert can chime in as well if, if need be.
contract starts October the 1st of this year? November 1st. Okay. I hadn't really ever thought about this, but the, the five one-year extensions with the amount of effort that you've put into making this determination, is a one-year extension sufficient if we would be looking at a transfer or change? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it, it, if we were to do, if, if, if and, and it's in the contract, I mean, if we were to have issues, um, it would be a six-month transfer. Not a one year. Thank you. <coughs> I move we adopt item E2. I second. Okay. It's been first and second to adopt E2. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Item E3 is a resolution approving a contract amendment with HDL companies for sales tax audit services. Well, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Uh, this item is to approve a contract amendment with HDL companies to add the sales tax audit services. Currently, they're providing us with our monthly sales tax reports and our confidential data, as well as some forecasting tools which help us to develop our sales tax projections and reports. Uh, we also have Richard Fletcher and Katie Biggers with HDL companies on Zoom, and they'll be able to answer any questions that you may have regarding their services. So historically, the, the city has not undergone a sales tax audit. This would be the first one. Um, and sales tax, as you know, makes up a significant portion of our general fund budget. Uh, it amounts to around 30% of total revenues um, each year. Uh, additionally, the Victoria Sales Tax Corporation <laughs> contributes around $8 to $9 million per year uh, in support of uh, CIP and economic development projects in the area. So it is an, an important source of revenue for the city. A little bit about the process. Um, one of the methodologies that will be used is uh, a boundary audit. Uh, this will look at you know, whether is the business in the city limits of Victoria do they have a sales tax permit, and are we receiving payments from the from the comptroller from uh, these businesses? Another methodology is on non-filers, and that would be businesses in the city with sales tax permits that are not remitting sales tax on a monthly or quarterly basis. Aerial canvassing, this is performed virtually, and this is basically just looking for businesses uh, that do not have a permit tied to the address. And then finally, a deep dive on taxability, and this is looking at whether or not we're, like sales tax is being collected on all taxable services um, and then whether or not we're getting sales tax permit information for retailers that come in for, for festivals and other events like that. The audit itself, it does not involve auditing individual businesses, um, but taxpayer outreach and education will be performed. And typically, this does result in uh, compliance from these businesses or individuals in, in submitting their, collecting and remitting their sales tax. Uh, the audit is estimated to take about nine months, and any fees are contingent upon a percentage of findings and amounts subsequently collected by the city. Um, as far as the future, this is just the initial step and uh, an overall strategy for ensuring the city is collecting all of its tax revenue. Uh, two of the other major sources are our hotel tax revenue and our franchise tax revenue. Uh, we plan to engage uh, in audits for those as well in, in fiscal 22 and, and beyond. And that's all that I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, we do have representatives from HDL if there's any more specific questions. I have a question. Yes, um, are there other tax auditing firms in the state of Texas besides HDL? I mean, why were the, why was HDL picked? Or they they currently provide us with the sales tax and audit reports, and this is just another service that they add. Which again, it's not there's no no fee associated with it unless there are findings. Have they done this in other cities, and how much <clears throat> have they realized in other cities? I mean, it's a good idea. Right. The, they have an... Oh. Yeah, we can let them address that. Hello? Sure. I, I'd be happy to address that. We, um, we provide this service. Um, my office in Texas only does this in Texas. 
and we have uh, between 120 and 140 municipalities under contract, uh, the largest being the city of San Antonio, Denton County Transit Authority, the city of Louisville, um, and then small special districts as well. Uh, so we, we do work with, you know, again, around 130 uh, local governments in Texas to provide the service. Thank you. What if the audit reveals a correction in taxes owed that's a decrease? Do we get 30% back for that? <laughs> we, we do not look for, so we would only question revenue that should be there and it's not. We're not testing everything that comes in to determine if it's good money or not. Um, we, we don't typically identify uh, tax as being received incorrectly. And, and typically we'll see those. But if we, if we did, no, it would not decrease our fee <laughs> to answer your question. That's, that's kind of tongue, tongue in cheek. And, and just to, to, to add to that, the, the comptroller would typically find those audit adjustments and then that'll be deducted from our, our monthly payments. So. Yep. Do y'all also do the hotel tax um, audits and the franchise tax audits, or would that be somebody else that would be doing that, Wesley? Well, we no, we, we have the ability to do the hotel tax um, the hotel tax audits directly. We we even provide a full hotel tax administration service where we can collect the revenue as well, and then we partner. Uh, we currently partner with someone that does the franchise fee audits. Okay. Those elements are still to be determined. So tonight is strictly just the sales tax piece, mm -hmm. but we wanted to present it a, as an overall strategy because this has been part of the focus of the administration to try and ensure that we are, quite frankly, receiving all the funds that we should be getting. Um, I know that that had come up um, in some conversations with some of you um, upon my arrival. Um, and so now we're officially taking that step to try and do that. Thank you. And I have one more question, comment. Yeah, just for Ms. Solis, uh, we've been doing hotel audits for quite a while already, uh, for the past seven, eight years. Okay. And we do have a firm engaged to do that, and I believe they're going to do it this year too as well. Okay, good. And that's more of a, we take a handful of hotels at a time. Yeah. That process is a little bit more robust because it does necessitate going in and cross-referencing, you know, stays versus funds and things of that sort. So normally... The hotel tax audits aren't something that you do all the hotels at once. It's normally something that you do, you know, two or three hotels this year, another two or three hotels the following year, and it's kind of spread out. That piece we've been doing. The franchise tax part, we haven't really been doing either. Um, and so that'll be a first once we get to that part of it. Um, but we realize that in my experience and even with HDL's experience, the sales tax piece is really where... Um, the opportunity lies. And quite frankly, it's more on the educational piece um, because oftentimes where you um, find uh, those opportunities for additional revenue is in the lack of understanding from certain businesses on the items that they sell that should be assessed the sales tax that currently are not. And so that's the piece that we want to better educate um, our businesses on. Those education processes that would be done individually is that how you would address them? You mean individually with a specific business when right, an right. issue arises? Yes. yes. Okay. I move we adopt item E3. I second it. Okay, is any more discussion? It's been first and second that we adopt resolution uh, E3. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So now we are going to go into executive session now. Do we want to break? Let's just break for five minutes right now. If that's okay. Or we can. April, are you going to read it? Yes. Okay. So the city council will recess for executive session on the sixth day of July, 2021 at 629 PM. The subject matter of the executive session deliberation is as follows executive session in accordance with Texas government code 551.072 to deliberate the purchase exchange lease or value of uh, real property interest. 
due to the fact that deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the city in negotiations with a third party. Okay, do we want to take a break? Or do we want to just yes. go into it? Yes. Okay, let's take a break. Five minutes. <laughs> 